Google Play description was like, long lost Tennessee Williams play, and I'm like, maybe he lost it for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back to Chris Stravaganza. Clearly, Sarah is my guest today. Or the it's pillow. It's me. <laughs> I specifically chose Sarah for this movie because it takes place in the South. Today we watched The Loss of a Teardrop Diamond, which is based on a Tennessee Williams play. It's actually just the play on screen. It seems to be. Yeah. Since he had the sole writing screenplay, screenplay credit and he was dead when they made this movie. Yeah. He so. died in 1983 and this movie is from 2008. This movie was directed by Jody Markell. I don't know who that is. So do we want to describe the plot? Right, we, we need to do a synopsis. So Lost of a Teardrop Diamond is about straight people written by a very, very gay person. It's like an anthropological study of like rich <laughs> straight people. It's yeah. so weird. Bryce Dallas Howard plays this woman named Fisher. Uh, she is this southern woman. She's the daughter of a guy who has just been rocked by this huge scandal because he blew up part of the levee and it flooded like a ton of farms and land south of where the levee was and it also killed a couple of people and apparently he told them that this was going to happen. That's not really important to the story. We never find out if that's really true. Everybody in the town really hates him and by extension blames his daughter too. So she's struggling with that. She's also struggling with her weird thirst for Chris <laughs> Evans's character. Who? She is not the only one that's struggling with this weird thirst. Like, there's there's something in that water in this town. <laughs> Everybody is thirsting after Chris's character. It occurred to me right at the end <laughs> of the movie, with what he does, that I was just like, if this were literally anybody but Chris Evans, we would not be cutting him this much slack. We would be calling him a jerk through the whole movie. Yeah. Not because he does anything particularly bad, but because, like, Bryce Dallas Howard is, like, throwing herself at his feet. Like, love me, love me, please, right? And he doesn't necessarily owe her anything for it, but he also doesn't put her down gently. Yeah, at he all. doesn't put her down at all, is the weird thing. Like, he's like a little bit bashful. She sure. tries to kiss him about halfway through the movie, and he very clearly, like, moves his head away. It was painful to watch. I just, oh, we'll get there. Oh, oh. I think that when somebody likes you that much, like, clearly likes you that much, and is like putting themselves out there and you're just not interested, I think you kind of owe it to them to just be like, no, I'm sorry, think, but just so that you don't get any ideas right. or get any hope, I don't want to get your hopes up, the decent thing for me to do is to say, I'm not interested. And I don't disagree. I think in his case, they make it very clear that he's poor and she's paying him to like take her to these parties around town. And I think he feels, not necessarily that he feels responsible for her, but that like, because she's paying him, she has that power over him. So I feel like because it's not just like, they're just friends, she's actually like giving him financial incentive. Yeah. It becomes very difficult for him to say no to that. Which is not me trying to justify the situation. No. It's it just makes it all that much more complicated. Complicated. It's exactly what I was going to yeah. say. Yeah. Fisher uh, clearly likes him and wants more from him, but she doesn't feel like she will ever be able to like attain actual human connection. And so she's much more interested in throwing money at him so that she can kind of force him to go to these events with her. And then they, they go to a party. She, uh, title, loses an earring in the driveway. And then it's this whole thing. And that's where we spend the rest of the movie. And it's, it's some metaphor that I don't entirely <laughs> understand. I feel like it's a lot of Tennis William plays, though. There is a girl liter who's literally introduced as Vinny. My cousin. We'll get to my cousin Vinny. She finds the earring and then she doesn't want to give it back and it's because she's poor and it turns into this whole moral thing. But Bryce Dallas Howard is really sad because she accuses Chris Evans of stealing the diamond earring and it's 
weird, and then we think that he's gonna reject her at the end, and then he doesn't entirely reject her, and it ends kind of on that note. This is, this is why I was so sure that it's like the gay view of the straights. <laughs> on to our pros and cons. So Bryce Dallas Howard is just like the first pro. Cause she's Bryce Dallas Howard. The like beginning of the movie has it's like Bryce Dallas Howard and then everybody else on screen is black. And that's not something and we, we were like, see. All right, cool. Yeah. Interesting. And then and they then never come back. We saw one, maybe three or four black people after that. Yeah. Uh, she has a dark bob and a fancy car and she's and driving around and it's in the twenties. And I was like, this is giving me like Miss Fisher in the South vibes, and I'm like, I like Miss Fisher. It reminds me of the show that I like. <laughs> and what was funny is that then in the next scene we learn her name is Fisher. Yeah. I was very confused. And you know what else? Her aunt's name is also, also Fisher. Fisher. And tell Auntie Fisher I'm gonna sleep for hours. I wrote down makeup because I think you had made a comment about the makeup, but it's, you know, 1920s vintage. Yeah, makeup, I thought it was. So. I thought the makeup on Bryce Dallas Howard was actually pretty good because I didn't feel like they were afraid of covering up Bryce Dallas Howard's face. Mm -hmm. It looked pretty spot on for like films, 1920s films that I've seen. Oh, there's a Yorkie, but only one. We liked the costumes pretty much for the same reason that we liked the makeup. Chris always looks good in a suit. We wrote down Jimmy's rejection of Fisher as a pro because it was like the first time in the film that we actually felt something for her. She's kind of abrasive and very, goes against the grain of society. It just comes off as very like, at least at the beginning, comes off a little pretentious because she kind of like flaunts the fact that she's a rich woman. Person of my kind never has enough money. Yeah, she's also very much that friend that you know that like doesn't really have a lot of regard for her own personal well-being yeah. and just likes to party and be the center of attention. This is going to be the first debut party of the season at which I will shine with pride. Doesn't really think about anything past the immediate moment. Yeah. And that's fine. It's fun a to lot be around to for a, a like. short amount of time. Yeah. But like after a while, it gets exhausting. Yeah. Especially because you realize, like, they don't really care about anybody but themselves. Yeah. So then, like, when she tries to kiss Jimmy and he, like, reacts negatively to that, we were like, oh, okay. Yeah. She because... does care about somebody else, but they, right off the bat, don't really care about her oh, the same yeah. way. The next one is my cousin Vinny. Vinny, my cousin. And uh, we just thought that was really funny. I... <laughs> the next one is Miss Addie, who is this old woman. She's Julie's... Julie is... Uh, the woman hosting the party. Right. Where we spend about 80% of the movie. Yeah, and probably just should have spent... 100%. Yeah. Maybe or, 95. Yeah. Miss Addie is Julie's aunt, who is disabled. She's old and seems to have uh, heart and health problems and then as a result develops an opium addiction to treat the pain and self-medicate. Right. She is then removed from an environment from which she is able to obtain opium and is taken off of it and She's in a lot of pain, and she longs for death. <laughs> and that's not why we liked Miss Addie. That's not why we liked her. We liked Miss Addie because she was very straightforward and did not beat around the bush, and was one of the only characters that showed any kind of true affection towards Fisher. I remember the last time I saw you, the impression you made on me. There was something hard and honest about you. She's the only one that is like giving Fisher credit for these characteristics that she should be praised for. We also liked the part later on where Vinny that bitch. <laughs> interrupts the scene. She's just being fussy about something and she's accusing Fisher of something or whatever and Miss Addie is just like, Julie, will you please take yourself and this other girl out of here? And we were like, yes! <laughs> We liked that scene very much because yeah. we'd had it up to here with Vinny. <laughs> the next one is Fisher backing out of the party. <laughs> <laughs> so the 
party gets real weird, and Fisher has no idea what anybody is talking about. She's already having a, having an existential crisis at this party. Yeah, she's and, having the worst time. Guy she hired to be her boyfriend isn't cooperating. Has <laughs> met his ex at the party, and they're rekindling in a really gross, straight way. Yeah, and like <laughs> Fisher is just like, I'm uh, gonna back the. F Go better this one. What's funnier is that they they're about to like play a game where like it's a kissing game, and I'm like, they start to explain the rules of this game. We start to see it in action, and I'm like, this doesn't sound like a very fun kissing game because it just sounds like two people get to kiss and everybody else has to sit there while they kiss outside, and that just does not sound like a party. And then randomly out of nowhere, a guy picks up a lampshade, takes the top off the lamp. <laughs> Starts using it like a microphone and sings a song that everybody else seems to know the words to. Fisher has no clue. And like they just start singing along with him, and it's the weirdest thing. It's like and a then cult. Paige and I are like, "What's going on?" <laughs> and then we look at the screen, and Fisher's like, "Back in the hell up out of the room." The way that it was filmed mm -hmm. and edited, it might have been like the best shot in the whole movie. Yeah. Best editing in the whole movie. It was. Perfect. Julie attempts to be a good wing woman. Uh, as they're handing out cards to play this kissing game, she gives Fisher the Ace of Spades, which is apparently the highest one in the deck, because that is supposed to be how Fisher gets Jimmy alone for three minutes. They don't really explain all of the rules. As they're like looking for the person with the ace of spades, Julie is like, ace of spades, ace of spades. <laughs> like really trying to get Fisher to just speak up and let it happen. Everybody is thirsty for Jimmy. Oh my God. Everybody, Miss Addie, thirsty for Jimmy. Miss Addie like compares him to God, Yeah. which was weird. Now go quick with God. With Jimmy Doma. Well, isn't he? The whole freaking movie is about Fisher being thirsty for Jimmy. Vinny is thirsty for Jimmy. Julie is the only one that doesn't say anything about being thirsty for Jimmy. Well, there's that lady at the party, at the first party we go to. I've been released for the ball. And he's like, well, you're not paying me, so. And she like practically like, has a heart attack like, I'm shot. sorry, miss. And she's like, camera. Oh, and then there's the silhouette shot at the very end. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah, it was probably like the most interesting shot in the movie. Besides her backing out of the party. You probably didn't write this down because you weren't turned on by this like I was, but like the part where she like goes to confront him and she and you think, oh, she's gonna she's gonna be like tender and reveal feelings and she's not gonna be, you know, a jerk. And then she's she is a jerk. And then he like weirdly backs her up against the wall. And they have this really intense eye contact. And I'm like, this is the one moment in this movie where I was attracted to Chris Evans. And that just gives you an idea of what I like. <laughs> I mean, I would be fine if Chris did that to me too. <laughs> That's it. Those are all of our pros. We're going to move right into cons now. Okay, so well, right off the bat, we don't need the first 20 minutes. There's a difference between starting like in media's res and like just dropping yourself into a random yeah. place in the movie, in the story. It didn't feel like this was the beginning of a story where I'm going to slowly gather the information. It felt like I had been placed into the middle of a story where I had already missed 20 minutes. Yeah, like the book was three chapters longer, but the three chapters came before where I started, but then they had been ripped off of the spine. Yeah. And I had no context for it anything in it those just, three chapters. It like the pacing just felt really off. It wasn't even that it was throwing a lot of information at us. It was just that it didn't feel introductory. Yeah. She goes to his house and has this conversation with him about something that was hard to follow. Well, you don't mean you're greedy, do you? No, I just know that I'll have to buy most everything that I want. It felt like something that either required more build up or needed to jump ahead entirely. Yeah, I don't think we needed to have gone to that first party. No. At all. Maybe. They just go to the one party where they spend over 80% of this movie. They can go over everything that they've gone over before at that one party, and I think it would make the story stronger. It would like really enhance a lot of the things that that Fisher is feeling, or that the other characters are saying. Not very extraordinary cinematography. No. I mean, it could have been better. It could have used a little bit more color grading. Can Chris exist in the past? Really Every like time I see his like younger face, even in these other videos that you've watched, I'm like, like his hair. It's something about his hair. Like it's just too 
It's two aughts. I can't look at it and think. I mean, he didn't have frosted tips or anything. Well, no, but I don't know what, I don't know. There's dog discrimination where the rich lady is like, no dogs can enter the gardens. And I was like, well, f your garden then. How do Fisher and Jimmy know each other? You really get the sense that they have known each other for a really long time, but it's Never referred to. You know my father, Mr. James Dobin. He's in charge of your father's commissary. The in media arrest just like doesn't work. We've already kind of talked about it, but it just doesn't work for this movie. It makes it really hard to connect with it for a while. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like the first time I actually connected with what was being said was when Fisher and her aunt were sitting at the breakfast table right. and Fisher's just like downing black coffee instead of eating. And they're actually having a conversation that feels like there's some humanity in it. It's not the end of the world. No, the beginning. Up until that point, it's either too confusing or it's too like, yeah, you can tell this is a stage play. It should just be a stage production. Oh, we could have avoided that sex scene in the car. Yeah. If it had been a stage play, hopefully. You made a comment at the beginning where they would show Fisher and Jimmy doing similar things or having similar feelings to the thing that they're doing, but mm -hmm. they're not in the same space. Yeah. And that was kind of intriguing. It didn't really go anywhere. It didn't. Their personal stories really only overlap because she's paying him to go to this party with her. And because they somehow know each other. Yeah. Maybe that's why we didn't like it so much, because we're just like, do these two people even really have any like meaningful interaction until Not the really. end? Like so Jimmy has this like weird conversation with his dad. At some point in the conversation, he's just like, so Fisher Willow has um given me money to go to these parties with her. She's hinted repeatedly that she'd like intimacy with me. He's essentially asking like, should I do it, Dad? Should I whore myself out? And then his <laughs> dad's like, um, you know, <laughs> the thing about that is... I think and I then, hear the phone ringing. <laughs> Fisher's car like drives up and he's like, okay, I'm going inside. <laughs> I'm escaping from this conversation. It also didn't come to anything. No. It was yet another thing that could have just been entirely removed because it made me feel weird about whether or not he was truly ambivalent mm -hmm. because it's just such a weird conversation to have if you are ambivalent about it. He's not wrestling with conflicted feelings. He's like, I don't know, should I I don't know, say lovey. I think the only reasons that he even considers it is the fact that his father is poor and drunk and his mother is in an asylum and also- with some form of dementia. Yeah. It's very sad. It does not it come doesn't up very go much. anywhere. It does not go anywhere. Mm -hmm. He goes and visits her twice and she can't remember who he is, which is sad, but it really has almost no bearing on the his. rest of it. When he's visiting his mom is like really the only times where he s displays any emotion other than like ambivalent and then ambivalent anger. And like, I know that Chris has better range than this. Oh yeah. So I don't think it's Chris. I really think it's this character. We briefly mentioned that Fisher accuses Jimmy of stealing the earring when they get to this house party. It after falls they, off her ear yeah. when they get up, when she gets out of the car. Yeah. And they start looking for it in the driveway. They can't find it, so when they finally go in, he's like insisting that he be, he be strip searched. Hey, that damn girl thinks I stole a diamond dog, and that's why I got to be searched. And that it's like some was... kind of like weird decorum thing. Or like he a like, pride thing. Yeah, a, he, he like kind of accuses her of- um, Accusing him. Yeah. I... And it's like, but, why does that matter? We don't know why that matters to Jimmy because he's so ambivalent is really the only word we can use to describe him. So in the scene with Miss Addie, Fisher sits on the bed next to her and then the lights in the room dim and oh, there's yeah. just a spotlight on her. And, we're, and she gives a monologue. Right, so we're sitting there like, this is clearly like stage direction. There's nothing wrong with that being in a movie Especially when it's an adaptation of a play. I mean, and but there are no like, rules. But besides like, the writing, that was the first time that this ever felt like it was a stage production. It was the first time the film made a choice to do something that was a bit more outside of the realms of like just right. grounded filmmaking. Yeah. Everyone Julie knows is awful. I guess except for Miss Addie. That's really it. Like Miss Addie's fine. Yeah. Everybody else is just terrible. 
They're like obnoxious and they're especially mean to Fisher in front of Julie, and Julie does nothing about it. I'm like, Vinny, wow, what Vinny's a great friend. terrible. Those twins that look exactly alike, never given any names. They wear the same pearls. They wear the same dress. Their hair is exactly the same. It's like a slightly different shade of blonde, but it, otherwise it's the same. They're awful. I hate them so much. That party was really where the movie started, and that's really where things began to happen. Yeah. And I feel like as painful as that scene at the, the levee was, where he pulls back from the kiss, perhaps it would have been more effective had we learned about that later. Had it been a mystery, like that this is why these two are acting so weird about each other. This is why she gets so angry about the earring. This is why she accuses him, because she's upset about him rejecting her not 30 minutes before. Yeah. It just makes it a bit more compelling, maybe. Jimmy sleeps with Vinny. And really, like, besides the fact that we hated Vinny right off the bat, because she's just terrible. She was so mean. Yeah, for no reason. Needlessly mean. Just the fact that we had to sit there and watch this awful woman who was mean to the character that was starting to grow on us yeah get it on with chris in a car he, he was would never to, have suggested it. yeah he was, was more like, than willing to follow the rules of the game and only like be in a room with her for three minutes and then and go back out to the living and then room. go back to the living room but then she's like no oh, let's, let's get in my car let's go have sex in a car and i'm like girl because it felt like she was just doing it out of spite. After they were done, she was kind of like... Well, I couldn't consider marriage with a man I wasn't attracted to. Physically, Jimmy. And I'm like, okay then. And then she proposes to him. She just kind of like states that they're going to get married. Yeah. And she's like, I'm going to be free from poverty to love. And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's gonna work out for you, girl. Also, the last con is that um, Vinny stole the earring. She saw it in the driveway. The camera definitely like let you know that she saw it. She's just not gonna give it to her. Yeah. There's a lot of weird back and forth about like, oh, we found the earring, but like then we're gonna lie about it. Then like, Chris Evans makes a big thing about it, and it's weird and embarrassing and cringy, and I'm like. What's going on? It's a whole It's a whole thing. weird thing. And I'm not even really sure what it was supposed to convey to me. No. Because, like, I feel bad. The one place where I feel bad for Vinny is the fact that, like, Jimmy is supposed to be, like, the noble poor, which I think is a damaging message anyway. And it's just a way that rich people fetishize poor people in poverty uh, while never having to deal with it themselves. And that's... Kind of where it came out because Vinny was really mean and poor. It's got some weird messages the tied stuff, in there. stuff, I mean, I think it was a very muddled kind of thing. I mean, I think the closest that we could come to, like, pinning down any kind of message from it is just that, like, money and class create a lot of unhappiness in yeah. people. Yeah. There's a slightly recurring thing with Fisher saying things along the lines of, I have all of this money and it doesn't really mean anything to me because it's never going to be able to buy me things that I actually want. Like Jimmy. Like Jimmy, like someone who will love me. I recognize what Jimmy is, mm -hmm. as far as the type of person who like has plausible deniability of not being the jerk, because he hasn't actually said no, but that's what makes you a jerk. When somebody's putting themselves out there so vulnerably, as much as Fisher does, as honestly as Fisher does, I think it is cruel to not give a straight answer if you are sure mm -hmm. that you do not like them back. If you are not going to be able to return that affection, I think it's cruel to deny them an answer because all they will do is continue to hope that you will change your mind. I think Fisher isn't paying Jimmy to get him to say yes. She's paying Jimmy because she's lonely. She's and lonely. And she likes him. And she wants the illusion of companionship. Yeah, and I think he thinks that maybe she's paying him so that he can't reject her. And it's not like he's obligated to like anybody. It's just that he seems ambivalent about pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really seem to have that much interest in Vinny. It's just like, I hate people who are like that, where you pour affection and your time and stuff into them. And all they do is take it and say, okay, message read. That person will bleed you dry and you do not have to put up with it. There are people in this world who will enthusiastically be your friend or your partner or whatever. You don't have to waste your time on somebody who is meh 
about you? So our arbitrary rank was from Clara Leah 27. And it was how full my tear glasses by the end. I mean, we didn't really cry. I didn't get anywhere close to crying. No, but we did like feel very strong feelings, very strong sad feelings about Fisher. Oh yeah, I'd be sad too if Chris Evans just continued to low-key reject me the whole time. Yeah. The IMDb score is a 5.9. The Rotten Tomato score is 4.73. My score... I mean, I guess I liked it more than Fantastic Four. I'm gonna give it a 5, because... 5 is ambivalent, since it's out of 10. And your score? I'm like between a 4 and a 5, because like... On the one hand, it had a lot of really boring elements, mm -hmm. but there were also some pretty good emotional things going on. Sometimes for some four, let's just, just just let's just do a four. So the total point value for the loss of a teardrop diamond is nineteen point six three out of 40, which seems about right for this movie. I had never seen this movie before. I know you had never seen this movie before either. I don't think I'll be watching it again. I don't either. I'm kind of glad I only paid like $2 for it. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please click the bell below so you don't miss any of our other videos, including more Chris Travaganza, because I just, I'm making my way downtown very slowly. If you're not already subscribed to The Princess and the Scrivener, please do so down below as well, especially if you'd like to see more videos on Disney, intersectional feminism, pop culture critiques, Chris Travaganza, and more. Push is next. I have not seen it in a very long time. So I can't remember what my feelings on it are, but you'll see soon. See you next time. See you real soon.